Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Vas Vasiliadis from the University of Chicago. I'm going to be talking to you about uh, the Globus project. Uh, I'll cover a few things today. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, just by show of hands, who's familiar with Globus or has heard of it? Okay, so a few of you. So some of this might be a little repetitive. I apologize. Um, I'm just going to run through a, a high level view of um, what the Globus service is, um, how it looks from a researcher's perspective, and in that I'm mostly going to do uh, a brief demonstration and a live demonstration, uh, talk about some common use cases about how it's being used, um, both in sort of in an interactive mode as well as in some automated um, research data management uh, flows. Uh, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on how it's being used in a data publication context because obviously that's more relevant uh, to you folks. Um, and then I'm going to close off with uh, some of the things we're doing on the sustainability side because that's something that's been sort of core to our mission uh, from, from day one. Uh, and so, uh, and, and day one was about 10 years ago and this was sort of the, the picture on campus of what people's uh, data looks like in their labs. Um, I think one of these was actually on our campus. I forget which one. Um, and I, I, I show this slide because I'm particularly intrigued by this, this numbering scheme. Those who can't see it in the back, each of these drives is numbered. So there's obviously an index somewhere that um, is you know, being used to track that data. And, and one wonders what happens when the grad student who has that index uh, Excel file uh, leaves the institution. right? Uh, so, so obviously the question is how do we in this sort of environment, how do we move and share and, and describe data and make it um, reproducible and discoverable? Uh, and really, how do we facilitate data stewardship right throughout the, 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 the research life cycle? So, so we came at this from Globus. And actually, and just a, sort of a quick snapshot here of where Globus um, has come from. So as a technology, it's been around for the better part of two decades now. Um, the early days were uh, fraught with peril for those that, that might have tried using Globus back then. It was a very painful exercise. Um, so about um, eight, eight or nine years ago, we launched this software as a service to really make the Glo um, Globus accessible to anybody, really. Um, no sort of deep tech experience required. Uh, just some milestones in particular. Again, I'll talk to sustainability at the end, but we are approaching our 100th subscriber, uh, at least I'm, I'm hopeful that that will show up sometime next month. And, um, and we are well on our way to becoming fully self-sustaining. We're, we're well over 50% at this point, but we still do have a lot of grant uh, funding. So the way I like to summarize what Globus does is really acting as a bridge between data and people, uh, both within the organization and between um, institutions. And at its core, what, what we try and do is present sort of a unified um, view of data, irrespective of what type of storage system it's on and, and where that storage system lives, be it on campus, be it at a, a, a national facility somewhere, be it in the, in the public cloud, and so on. <clears throat> and then we do try and make it as easy as possible for researchers anywhere to share with their collaborators and also to make their data sets uh, more widely available to, to the community, again, either in the form of public repositories or in their own um, storage, be it, again, on-premise on or, uh, or in the cloud. <clears throat> so the core functions of Globus, so we started out basically as a file transfer tool. Uh, and, and the idea here is that a researcher can come along and say, move some data from a storage system somewhere, and that can be, as I say here, it might even be an instrument in many cases, that is the case, and, uh, and move it to some other machine. And that request goes into Globus, and at that point, the service takes over, and uh, researcher can go off, you know, shut their laptop down, and, uh, and the data just move between those two systems with Globus monitoring things, making sure that it can recover from any, you know, transient errors and so on. Um, so it's really a fire and forget kind of mentality uh, when you're moving you know, even small data sets, but typically you know, the larger data sets where it does become critical to make sure that things, things, are, not, uh, things are, are progressing as they should. Uh, when you want to share data, uh, what the researcher does is select the data they want to share, and they set permissions for who can access that data via Globus. So this is not changing anything on the underlying storage system. So Globus has this philosophy of really not touching the, the storage. The storage is yours. You administer it and configure it and set policies on it. 
Um, and Globus just sort of sits as an overlay on top of that. Right, so we have these permissions that are sort of sitting on, uh, above your storage system, if you will, and then another research at another institution can come along, log into Globus, and, and, and access the data the same way. And then when you get more to sort of a, uh, a more formal publication um, uh, situation, what you can do is uh, attach metadata to this collection or this data set and uh, optionally put it through some kind of curation step. Um, and then we have a, a search facility whereby others can come along and discover um, and you know, reuse that data, pull it down to their systems by the same means. And all of this, for the most part, is available just via a web browser. We do have other interfaces I'll talk about briefly later on. Um, it's, I say it's accessible on any storage. That's not strictly true. We don't support everything, but we are working hard to add what we call connectors to, to support uh, essentially any type of storage system. Um, and very importantly, for many people, they can use the service using, um, with their existing identity. So they don't have to create yet another username and password um, just, just to, to, to access the service. So with that, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna switch out of slides and, and do what my mother always said I shouldn't do, which is do live demos. So let's hope this works. <clears throat> okay, so here's the, the Globus uh, homepage. So I'm gonna go log in, and, uh, and here is where you'll see, can everybody read that at the back? Should I make it a little bigger? Okay, so this is uh, our federated identity system. We call it Globus Auth. So we have about 560 or maybe close to 600 now different identity systems that, that we trust. These, these come to us through different federations like InCommon and EduGain. Uh, if you don't see your institution listed here, you can always use uh, Globus ID, that's our username and password, so you can go and create a, a Globus uh, username and just access the service that way. For, but for most people, hopefully, they, they have their institution listed here. So when I click continue, this will actually redirect me out to my identity system at UChicago. The, the thing for us is we don't want any credentials flowing through Globus if we can avoid that, so I will uh, log in here with my uh, UChicago ID, and uh, we have two-factor authentication enabled, so I will get uh, a code on my phone here and approve that. And then I'll be redirected back to Globus, and I'm logged in and looking at what we call the file manager. Yeah. Um, and so this is our main screen. Maybe I should make that a little bigger, so you can read that in the back. Um, so we have this concept of endpoints and, and collections. So an endpoint is a system that has the Globus software installed on it and can be accessed uh, via the service. So um, I'm just going to access one of the storage systems that, that, that I have data on, which is um, our high-performance cluster on campus called the Midway system. And you'll see when I click on that, it logs me right in. And that's because wherever possible, uh, Globus will try and do single sign-on based on the credentials that I've, that I've given it. So in this case, I logged in with my UChicago ID. This system recognizes it, so all is good. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to actually do a, a quick transfer between two other systems. So a common use case for us is people accessing uh, you know, large public data sets like um, the NCAR Research Data Archive that stores, I think, upwards of 30, maybe 50 petabytes of, of climate uh, research data. So actually, let me click on a bookmark that I have there. So here is, this is a, 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 a data set that's about um, a terabyte in size. So let's say I wanted to move this to um, one of the other systems I have access to, which is at Argon, uh, and that's called the petrol system. So I'm going to go there. And, and then the transferring is pretty straightforward. I select the files I want to transfer, and down here I click the Start button. And that's it, right? So you'll see up here it says uh, a transfer request was submitted successfully. So Globus now has this job to do, and it will go off and do it. And if it runs into any issues, it will try and work through them. If it needs some intervention um, from me, uh, it will send me an email. So for instance, if this is a very long-running transfer, and we've had transfers that run upwards of months, um, so my credentials may expire, in which case Globus would say, hey, Vass, go and log into you know, this system so the transfer can continue. Um, and it'll you know, pause and resume things automatically. So at this point, there's nothing I need to do further, just you know, go, go about my business. Uh, 
so that's the, in, in the simplest way what, what transfer is about. Um, the more interesting thing, and I'm going to go back here to my midway system, is I think more interesting at least, is, uh, is the ability to share, right? So uh, let's say I wanted to share this folder with, with all of you here. Let's say I had a group of you set up in Globus. So I can select that and click share. And it prompts me to create uh, a share. Let me just call it demo share because I think I have another one that I created by the same name. Right? And now I can grant permissions to any use, anybody that I want to. Um, I can only grant permissions that I have. So in that folder, I do have read write access. So I could give you access to read and, and, and write files there. Um, I can. Uh, I can select an uh, individual user, a group of users, uh, or I can make it more open and say anybody who logs into Globus has access to it. So <clears throat> that's essentially a, a public share, if you will, uh, except that you do have to, to log into Globus um, to get access to that. So um, I do have a demo user for this purpose, so I'm going to uh, search for that. And if you don't know the, um, the individual's uh, uh, username or ID or anything, uh, you can just put in their email address, and Globus will send them an email, and they can go, you know, go into Globus, and and you know, it'll automatically create accounts and all that, um, so they don't have to worry about it. So I can add uh, permissions here, and this user now has access. They have read access down here to uh, uh, to, to to that folder, right? So if I go back to the file manager and access that share. Right. You'll see that that's the set of files they're looking at on this system. This was the directory I shared. So they're kind of sort of locked into there. You can see they can't sort of navigate up from there. So it's a nice clean way of giving someone access to your data, even though they may not be part of your institution or they may not have um, an account on that storage system, wherever the data um, resides. Actually, speaking of identities, so we do have, as I said, a federated sort of identity and access management system here. So I can link a number of identities. I don't know if you can read those in, in, in the back. So, so here is my UChicago one. Uh, likewise, I have an Argonne identity. I have my University of Michigan ID from back in the day. So depending on you know, what people know me by, um, they could share with me with any of those identities. And uh, I could just access it, you know, irrespective of, of, of how I'm, I'm logged into, into Globus. So, so that's just a, a, a quick walkthrough. Let me go back to, to, uh, to some slides here. So we talked about that. Uh, so so, so how, do, how do all these systems become available or accessible via Globus? So it's using a piece of software called Globus Connect. Uh, there's two sort of major versions of it. One is a personal version, uh, so that, that you can run um, on, on a laptop, on a single user system. It doesn't require any special permissions to install, and it handles all the, the networking cruft, you know, firewalls, etc. cetera. Uh, so so it, pretty much anybody can just plug and play that, and they have an endpoint on their, on their laptop. Uh, more interestingly, there's Globus Connect Server. This is the thing you would put on a storage system, uh, and that would give access to anybody that has a local account on that system. Um, they could then uh, come in via Globus and access that system with whatever permissions they have. And as I mentioned earlier, we do support a lot of different systems. Um, any sort of POSIX compliance system is, is uh, supported out of the box. We do have a number of connectors here on the left uh, that we've released over the last uh, three or four years. Uh, Next up for us is a connected to box. That's been one that's been asked for by, by many people for a while now. So we, we're trying to work, uh, get that wrapped up soon. Um, and then there's a few others in the pipeline. And we keep adding to this. We keep getting requests. Uh, we've had requests for OneDrive and, 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 and various others. So we, we do try and, and keep up with, uh, with, with what uh, our users are asking us for. So you just saw me walk through some part of the, of the web interface. There is also a command line interface which is more interesting for those that want to script things and, and automate things further. And then ultimately, you know, in behind all of that is a, is a set of REST APIs. So if you want to access Globus programmatically, you can, you can just talk to those directly. And we've got lots and lots of sample code out there on how people are doing that. Uh, 
So that's our, our command line interface. It's, it's actually a little more full feature than, than the web uh, UI because there's a lot more options on some of the commands that are exposed through this interface. Uh, it's, it's an open source piece of code that you can actually go look at. Um, and so one of the ways people are using this is to integrate uh, Globus into, into their workflows. Um, and, and further, uh, they're actually using the Globus platform to build uh, science gateways, data portals, various other applications um, that are part of their sort of research workflows um, and th that allows them to, to manage data uh, a little more uh, in, in a more streamlined fashion. So here's a very high level view of some of the, the Globus services. So what you saw me uh, demonstrate just now was so Globus Auth, which is the sort of identity and access management piece that underlies everything. Uh, I, I showed you transfer. I did not show you search or identify. So the transfer and sharing were the, were the two key ones. And then there's additional services built, if you will, on top of those. Um, but I do want to spend a second just talking about Globus Auth because it really is um, a critical piece of the, of the puzzle here for us. So it's, uh, it's essentially based on OAuth 2, on the OAuth 2 standard, on an open ID connect for those that are familiar with those terms. So uh, what we've tried to do, <clears throat> other than um, allow people to access Globus with existing identities, We've tried to create um, a set of services that you can put, uh, that you can leverage in your own applications. So if you're building um, a data portal, uh, you don't have to go and build your own username and, and password managers and, and, and accounts database and so on. Um, you can just hook into uh, the Globus Auth service with literally a handful of lines of code with using standard libraries. And, uh, and then anyone that has an identity from one of those systems or one of those identity providers that I showed you earlier could access your application, right? So uh, assuming you've given them access, right? So, so there's, um, there's, there's a nice clean way to, to make your apps uh, sort of accessible to a broader community. Um, and you can also use it to secure your own APIs if you're building, if you're sort of, you know, we, we have some folks that are a little more sophisticated um, and, and are using Globus Auth to, to secure their own APIs. So other services can call those um, as part of the same flow. Um, <clears throat> so uh, as we've gone through um, the last few years, it's become clear that uh, it's not sufficient to have these sort of point and click interfaces. They're, they're good for sort of ad hoc work, but when you get to sort of scale and, and, and large research projects that need to do uh, you know the same tasks over and over, or and, you know, in, in an automated fashion. Uh, so we, we've built additional facilities to enable that. So uh, a very common one is you know doing things like scheduled backups, so or replicating data um, on a regular basis. So you've got you know scripts that will run and automatically kick off transfers that that put your data elsewhere. Uh, data distribution is a very common use case. So uh, for instance, from uh, you know, we, we, a lot of campuses have uh, next-gen sequencing centers and other things like that, um, where they, they'll pull data off um, and then they'll they'll put it onto some storage system. And using the sharing mechanisms, they'll make that data available to their users. Um, and in many cases, as I said, they're building sort of custom data portals, um, and and some of the, the the capabilities of Globus are built into those portals, both for data movement and for sharing. Uh, one of the biggest examples I mentioned, I showed you the, uh, that um, NCAR research data archive that I was transferring from. So if you go in and, and browse that archive, when you select a data set, you'll see one of the options, typically not for all the data sets, but for most of them there's an option to, to use the Globus service to transfer that. Um, so this NCAR was one of our very early users of, of the Globus platform and um, they, they continue to sort of build capabilities into their um, into their repositories. Uh, and what's becoming um, probably our, our, our biggest use case of late is, is pulling data off of instruments, right? So, uh, you know, be they you know, light source, sort of high resolution light sources like the advanced photon source or the ALS um, out at Berkeley, uh, you, know, high, you know, high res microscopes and so on. Um, we've got lots and lots of instruments generating lots of, of data. Um, and What's uh, particularly critical in these use cases is the, um, the, the researcher only has access to the instrument for a short period of time. 
uh, and then they have to get the data and get out, right? So they have to pull the data off of that instrument in a, in a reliable way because in many cases um, it's, it's very hard or in some cases impossible to replicate that experiment, right? It might be sort of a one-off sample or what have you. So uh, they, they want to pull that data off and, uh, and, and put it, again, in, into some uh, other system perhaps for, for, for analysis or for, uh, for sharing with their collaborators. So how do you do that securely, reliably? Um, so we've got uh, you know, a number of different use cases where instruments are sort of uh, enabled for Globus access and there are automated uh, mechanisms for pulling the data off those instruments as, the, as it becomes uh, available. Uh, a good example of this is at the Advanced Photon Source out at Argonne National Lab. Um, we have a, a researcher, Bobby Kasturi, who is um, uh, studying um, uh, the brain. He's essentially, he's undertaken to map the brain, right? Uh, to to uh, build out the, uh, the connectome, as they call it. So a massive undertaking. Um, so he does, he takes images. Um, uh, they, they talk about it as a, using a, a deli slicer. So they'll take uh, mouse brains or octopus brains, uh, slice them very, very finely, uh, and push them through um, uh, one of the light sources, and gather all the data. Um, and then there's a flow um, built behind this that's, that's uh, built on, you know, using the Globus platform, where after the imaging, the data are pulled off to an acquisition server. They go to another server that uh, with, with, um, they're pre-processed. Um, and then they're sent to um, a system sort of on the other side of the Argonne campus at the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility uh, where someone looks at that, so they, they do some initial reconstruction to see um, if this uh, image is sort of of adequate quality. Perhaps they might do some adjustments to the, to, to the machine, uh, to the instrument, um, and then once everything is good, they'll do a full reconstruction on that same, um, on, on that same system at, uh, at Argonne. And, uh, and then move, move the, uh, the reconstructed data to yet another system uh, um, called Petrol. You saw me move some data there earlier. Um, and, and there they will um, attach um, persistent identifiers to it um, and essentially publish it for the rest of the, of the group. And, um, and much of the group lives um, at the University of Chicago, so about 35 miles away from there. And, uh, and between them, as, as Bobby says, you know, science happens, right? So there's, there's some magic there, obviously. But uh, as far as the infrastructure goes, um, all of that is, is, uh, is enabled by Globus. And this is actually the, the kind of thing we're starting to see more and more of um, as, as a requirement out there. Um, there are also many uh, use cases where uh, Globus is helping people with the data management plans. Uh, so you're able to pull, again, from a you know, diverse set of systems. Maybe you pull um, raw data from, uh, from, from your instruments. You pull uh, you know, uh, process results from some uh, other um, uh, HPC cluster or something. And then perhaps you've got some additional data on your own machine, on your own laptop, uh, documentation, what have you, code. Um, and you can sort of put all that together in, um, in a data set, as we call it. And the data set has. Um, a number of policies that dis that define um, uh, you know who who can publish data sets into these collections um, and uh, and you know whether or not there's a curation required uh, what types of metadata are required and so on um, and uh, once that's published um, we'll uh, we'll mint uh, a, a, an identifier uh, it can be uh, a DOI it can be uh, an ARC a handle what have you. Um, and, and obviously that, that's then uh, available to, to, to others. Uh, so the, the current, what we call sort of our, our version one uh, um, of, of the data publication service, this has been around for uh, probably going on four years now. Uh, so this was an interesting exercise for us because when we first built this service, um, we really didn't understand um, the needs of the community, quite frankly. We, we assumed that... Uh, <laughs> For most people, you know, a nice turnkey sort of application uh, would, would do the trick, right? So you bring your own storage, that's where your repository lives, you decide where that is, um, and then um, we, you know, we provide some predefined <coughs> schemas and we mint these identifiers and so you can pull these data sets together and publish them in your repository and, and we're all done. Uh, the reality was obviously that that's, that's not the, the, the common use case. There is that use case out there, so we do have, you know, 
upwards of a couple thousand users and, and a few hundred data sets published, but it hasn't had the adoption that we'd hoped. Uh, so about two years ago, we, we started looking at, you know, really what are the other types of, uh, of use cases um, in, in sort of research data publication, right? So citable data, where your metadata tends to be more standard, where you do require strong persistent identifiers like DOIs, right? Um, then perhaps in community data where the schema is agreed on by the community, um, some of these um, data sets have sort of more fine-grained metadata because they are um, discipline specific, right? Um, and then within the institution, again, you know, it's the, there are multiple domains and, and lots of different storage systems. So trying to handle all of that from a publication standpoint um, was quite a challenge with the initial system. Um, and all the while, we still want to support this active research data, right? So it's not just about, you know, creating these immutable snapshots and, and, and then we're done. It's how do you manage data, you know, as it evolves, as the schemas and things change and so on. So what we did is starting about 18 months or, or thereabouts ago, uh, we, we took that publication service and broke it up into a set of, you know, microservices, sort of independent services um, that allow you to uh, essentially build your own flows, right? So, so you can, if you have an existing repository and you want to integrate some of these capabilities into it, so you can add, you know, data to your, to your uh, institutional repository, um, you cannot do that. Um, there are a, a number of services we have, uh, two of them, so other than, you know, the auth and transfer, which are already there, um, we do have a search service uh, this is actually built on, uh, on Amazon's Elasticsearch. Uh, and, and the nice thing about this, it's, it's sort of schema agnostic. So um, as our product uh, head says, you know, just give us your unwashed metadata and we'll, we'll just do, do the best we can, right? And we, so we'll index essentially whatever you give us. It just has to be in a, in a certain readable form and it's basically a JSON uh, type document. Um, and so uh, we can index that. Very importantly, we overlay the same access control mechanisms that we have in the rest of the global service on search. What that means is uh, you can determine or you can decide uh, who can see, who can actually search into this data, who can see this, this index or these indices, right? So um, it's, not, it's not sort of a, uh, it, it can be an open, uh, an open index, an open search, but in some cases, perhaps you have some, uh, some uh, you know, PHI data. So you say, you know, the, for this uh, data set, um, for this index, you only want people that have certain um, uh, permissions to, to, to get to it, right? Um, and, and what Global Search is, it, it creates a set of facets, so you can, you can filter by those and you can, you can, you can uh, sort and, and organize your data that way. Um, and it provides a, a, a rich query language so that you can write your own search queries and build those again into your own data portals um, and, and so on. And then the other service that, that we've tied to this is the identifier service. So again, this allows you to, to uh, mint different types of IDs, right? And so when you create an identifier, uh, very importantly, it's created within your own namespace. So we're not in the business of, of maintaining, uh, you know, DOI namespaces or anything like that. Um, and and it has, you know, an identifier has um, all these different attributes, right? It's versioned. Uh, you can control its visibility. Uh, every identifier obviously points to some kind of landing page with a link to the data. Uh, and so again, you can build this into your own um, data flows, data portals, what have you. Um, and the service we're working on right now, and we should have a, a first release of this probably in the next uh, month or so, uh, is the Globus Automate service. So this is taking um, all these uh, individual services and allowing you to compose them and use them um, in a flow. So you can define some automated set of steps that, that are triggered either manually um, or through some type of event, perhaps you know, data showing up on a capture device on an instrument will kick off a flow, a transfer flow, and then data showing up um, out of some analysis tool will kick off some kind of publication flow where that, that data gets its, uh, its metadata, it's indexed, and it you know, gets an identifier and, and so on. So all that can now be, um, or soon, uh, will be uh, automatable, um, and, and you can tap into that and build your own, um, your own flows. Uh, just some other applications here, and then I will wrap this up because we'll leave a few minutes for questions. Uh, 
So we've, we've also done um, some integration with Jupyter Hub. This has become, uh, you know, as many of you are aware, Jupyter is becoming sort of the, the de facto tool for interactive uh, data science. And so we've, we've built integration into the Jupyter Hub such that, um, again, using your existing identity, you can log into a Jupyter Hub instance that's, that you've set up on campus, or your, your researchers, rather, or your students can. Um, they can spin up um, Jupyter, uh, Jupyter, Hubs, uh, Jupyter servers and run their notebooks. Um, and within those notebooks, they can they have, then have access to all these Globus services with the same fine-grained security model that I've, that I've been describing. So this is a case. Uh, this, this example here is from our materials data facility at Argonne, uh, where they built these flows um, whereby they query this big data set of, of materials data. Um, they move it to Petrol, do some analysis um, using this parcel library, which is a parallel Python uh, scripting library, um, and then they push it out, sort of they publish it and, and make it available to the, the, the materials research community. Um, other examples, so this is from uh, the Wellcome Sanger Trust in the UK. Um, they've, they've integrated Globus. They've actually had this in place for quite some time. Um, where you can send them your uh, genomics data and, and they'll run uh, in, uh, imputation uh, tools on it. Uh, it's used extensively in sort of national cyber infrastructure, uh, Compute Canada and Exceed, so the, the two big providers of, of supercomputing resources in the US and, and, and Canada. Um, I'll skip those. And I just want to talk briefly about sustainability and then I'll open it up for questions. So. Um, so we've got, uh, over the past nine or so years since we launched the service, we've had some reasonably good adoption. Uh, all of this, uh, and thank you to our sponsors that have made it possible. So we've had grants from um, those agencies as well as some private foundations. Uh, we continue to get support from the university and, and, and from Argo National Lab. Um, but more importantly, we've, we've really, as I said um, at the beginning, we've tried to build sustainability into our core um, sort of value proposition, right? So what, what we want to do is make Globus self-sustaining, uh, and we decided to do that by having sort of a, a freemium model, right, like, like you would see in industry. So parts of the service, in particular the transfer component, um, is free for anyone to use, but uh, most of these other features that I've talked about uh, do require a paid subscription. Uh, so we do have, as I said, approaching on 100 subscribers, um, and, um, and you know, thanks to them we've actually uh, we, we, we're starting to, to get to the point where we can support everything without relying on grant revenue because grant funding is obviously not geared towards supporting operations, right? We are, um, in a sense, in the business of providing a, a production-grade service to the community, uh, even though we're sort of this group within the university, so we're kind of this odd duck in some sense. Um, but we're doing it from the perspective where, you know, we want it to be available for a long time, right? So, so there are different levels of subscription, Standard high assurance gives you all those additional protections for PHI and so on, and there's add-ons, um, and uh, and that's I'll I'll leave it there. Sorry, I haven't left too much time for questions, but I'm I'm happy to take any questions that you have or show you anything else. Okay, thank you very much.